All right, we're, good. we're in the book of Acts here this morning. Uh, we've got a, a bit of ground to cover with chapter 5 and 6 is where we, uh, we are left off. And uh, just a bit of a recap regarding this. We uh, started into chapter 5 with the uh, sudden tragic death of Ananias and Sapphira, two individuals who had uh, lied to the church, lied to God, uh, presented themselves as something that they were not, and they both fell dead in a very dramatic scene that opened up chapter 5. We talked about that. Um, keep in mind that what, um, where, the, where we are at this particular point in the development of Acts is, is Luke is uh, talking to us, showing us some of the developments of persecution that took place within the church uh, as they healed the lame man, they were arrested, they were brought before the uh, Sanhedrin, they were let go, and the church continued to grow, and God's Spirit was very evident. Uh, they, they were developing there. Now we had a, they had a little, little bit of a bump here in chapter 5 with an internal problem. First of all, we had some external persecution from the Jews that began to, has begun now to develop, and that's going to continue, and it will grow through the uh, remainder of the story. And we also have then this internal issue. So note that Luke, is, as a historian and, and a chronicler of the, the story of the early church, is giving us a full picture. It's, it's a multi-dimensional picture of what's taking place in the church, showing us all things that take place in the, the church of God. Uh, let's just kind of look at it that way, both then and now, and uh, in, a modern, in the modern setting, I should say. Uh, in, in, as, this, as the church develops, as people are involved, as Satan mounts his efforts to thwart the work of preaching the gospel, the unity and the harmony of the, of the, of the membership, these things uh, develop. And we saw that um, we got to the point here in chapter 5 where the continuing signs and wonders and miracles that were being done by the apostles, even to the point where it said of Peter's shadow passing over uh, people brought about dramatic uh, healings as well. That brought, again, attention from the Jewish authorities. They didn't like what was taking place, and then they arrested them again. They threw them back into prison, and there they were let out in a dramatic fashion by an angel of God, and they were told to go and stand in the temple and to proclaim these words of life. And that is um, a very interesting um, thing to consider, words of this life. And that's where they're found the next morning. They go into the temple, into an early setting in the, in the, in the, uh, the temple. I've, I've explained at that time that uh, the, in the ancient world, uh, without electricity, as soon as the daylight came, the activity started uh, bustling throughout the city. And that's where they, they found themselves. And as a result, they were discovered there by the captain of the, of the officers in verse 26, who uh, brought them without violence, it said, and because they feared the people, lest they should be stoned. And when they brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, Did not we strictly command you not to teach in his name, in, the, uh, in this name, and look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood on us. And so they said, basically, you've got your teaching, your doctrine, your set of interpretations of the, 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 the scriptures, which they did. And we've talked about that in, in the earlier classes, how God's Spirit was leading the church to look at the Scriptures, whether it was the Psalms or anything from the, uh, the books, of, books of the law, and to and understand them in a new setting with what had happened with the life and ministry and resurrection of Christ, His death and resurrection especially, and what was, what was happening now within the church. And so they were putting, a, in a sense, a uh, new interpretation or an added dimension of understanding upon many of the Scriptures, and that's why... The, uh, the Jews were upset. The Jews were saying basically, hey, this, these are our scriptures. The, this is our Bible, if you will. Uh, we studied this. We uh, have traditions of understanding and teaching. We have a script. You're off script. 
It's your doctrine. And that's really upsetting them as they, as they do this. People, um, you know, we get into habits and we have to, you know, a script is nice. I do a television program every month from a script. It's word for word and I don't get off script usually. If I do, then we had more time to it and the guys up in the um, post-production, they have all kinds of fits trying to fit, fit everything in. Uh, that's one setting here. I teach a class generally from notes and outlines, not a, a word-for-word -word script. But the script, you know, you know, it refers to this is what we say. This is how we say it sometimes. Or I didn't understand it that way. And, uh, you know, as, as we grow in grace and knowledge, we should understand that, you know, your narrative, your story, your understanding of certain scriptures changes, changes. Um, and in a sense, uh, I'm not saying that it becomes your doctrine and your pet, you know, uh, understanding necessarily, but there are many things about the Psalms and the Proverbs and the Gospels and the accounts in the Bible as we read it that it will apply to your life in, in, in unique ways. And because you're older, you've gone through experiences, you will, you will deepen your understanding. That's one level of a personal growth in our understanding of scriptures. What was happening with the, the church here when, when they said, look, you, you're, you're filling uh, the, the streets with your doctrine. We've taught you to not do this. Uh, they were showing Christ in the Old Testament. They were showing Christ in the Psalms. And these are the men who had engineered the death of Jesus Christ. And that, that's why that um, Peter responds the way he does in verse 29. Uh, Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. Now, this was an extreme statement of courage for Peter to stand and say that. He was not intimidated by this august Jewish council that he was now arraigned before. He'd already been there once, and uh, he'd uh, learned his, his lesson in terms of how they were, and uh, he'd learned a lot about that. And he's now there a second time, and he's, he says, we are going to obey God rather than men. Just understand the, the courage that that statement represents because it comes from a depth of conviction. Peter was convicted by the, the message, the gospel, the Spirit of God, what had happened. He was an eyewitness to the, re the, the resurrection, and he, he had a very deep conviction that was moving him. It was, a, it was the basis of his life. He had been, uh, he had been exhorted. He had been uh, taught. He had been moved by the, the teaching of Christ for the three and a half years that Christ was with them, and then the subsequent events of his death and resurrection, further teaching by Jesus, uh, and then his ascension and what is taking place. Peter now has a very strong uh, conviction about what has happened and what he believes and who he is and what he is supposed to say. Now, we develop those as well in our own lives to, to a degree as we uh, do the same thing and are convicted by the Word of God, the Spirit of God, and led to have a, a, a conviction to then do something. We, we, we will, you know, the, the, when we read and we read the word to repent, you had a, this, uh, Mr. Uh, Creech was with you this, earlier this week teaching you about the doctrine of repentance. And uh, when you understand what the Bible tells us about repentance, we are to be, uh, that, that's an exhortation. Repent, believe, be baptized, uh, understand. And it, it brings a level of engagement for us on our own level that then gives us a convict, uh, conviction uh, to commit to, to God. Uh, conviction leads to a commitment to God and to His Word, and Peter's expressing that. Peter is, is showing that right now by what, what he says. We're, we're, we ought to obey God rather than men. We're, in other words, we're not going to be intimidated by your, um, your admonitions, your edicts. He said, the God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. Him... God has exalted to His right hand to be Prince and Savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are His witnesses to these things, and so also is the Holy Spirit to whom God has given to those who 
obey him. And so they, um, they were, uh, again, showing this conviction very, very deeply. Notice that, that in verse 31, uh, Peter makes an interesting statement here as to how he looked at the, the, the Word of God. He says, God has given repentance to Israel. Now, Israel speaks to the entire nation that once was a united grouping of the tribes of, of, uh, of Israel, the, the descendants of the sons of Joseph, uh, the, that 12-tribe nation that had the name of Israel, that had long since ceased to exist with the captivity of the, the northern nation of Israel to the Assyrians, and then the southern uh, nation of Judah to the Babylonians, now having come back together for uh, several hundred years since the time of, of Cyrus and the Persians. And yet here, though he is speaking to the primarily a group of the, the, the predominant tribe uh, that was in, in the land, was that of Judah. Uh, along with Benjamin, that, made, that composed the, the nation of Judah. And there were, there were um, other um, uh, descendants of um, some of the other tribes that had migrated down long before it, during all the troubles in the nation of Israel. That's recognized by historians that, you know, some from Ephraim and Manasseh and some of the other northern tribes no doubt migrated down uh, and avoided the captivity of the Assyrian period, but that would have been a, uh, perhaps probably a negligible amount. Uh, but the, the primary tribe is, is Judah, but Peter's led to address the, that the fact that this repentance is now to all Israel and the ability for the forgiveness of sins. Now, other epistles of Paul show us when that ultimate uh, ability for Israel to repent and have their sins forgiven will ultimately take place. It didn't happen in the first century. Uh, that they are going to be grafted back on, as what Pete, uh, Paul shows in the book of Romans, uh, chapters 9, 10, and 11 where he, he, he kind of lays out here that God has not cast off His people Israel and that they will all be grafted back on, but that is for a future time. And so you, you see that, that part, understanding that helps you to appreciate what he, what he is saying here. Verse 32, he says, we're witness of these things. So also is the Holy Spirit that God has given to, a, to those who obey Him. Um, the end of verse 32, that statement is kind of another one of these markers that tells us uh, what is a, if you will, a, a part of the, the Spirit, that repentance, faith, baptism, laying on of hands, what uh, the Scriptures show here in Acts uh, being the, the, the um, let's say, the process to repent, believe, be baptized, and then with receiving the Holy Spirit. Um, this adds a little more understanding in that obedience is a part of what, it, what is required um, to receive God's Spirit and to be using God's Holy Spirit. God gives His Spirit to those who obey Him. So obedience to the Word of God, to the law of God, is a very important part of the whole process. Um, and so that, that helps us to, you know, that defines what repentance has brought a person to. Sometimes uh, people... Um, think that you know, they come to the church, they begin to learn about the Sabbath, the holy days, and the fullness of the, the Word of God and, and the law and what it means, yet they have been a part of another church, they've been baptized maybe when they were 12 years old, or sprinkled as an infant, or baptized even as an adult in some other uh, church uh, organization, but they didn't fully understand repentance, they didn't understand fully what, what uh, baptism was about. They were not fully obeying God because they didn't have the knowledge at that time. Sincere, yes. Uh, and yet this scripture helps people to understand that obedience is a part of repentance in order to receive God's Spirit. And I've shown this to a number of people through the years and counseling with people to help them understand you do need to be baptized no matter how old you are, you know, to be baptized again to become a, a, ultimately a member of the body of Christ and to receive the, the, the Spirit of God. That's the key thing there. And so moving on then in verse 33, we move here to um, a, a new part of the, of the scene here that, um, that shows up with the introduction of a gentleman by the name of Gamaliel. 
It says, when they heard this, they were furious. They collected Sanhedrin, and they plotted to kill them. Now, this is pretty extreme. They began talking among themselves. They'd already killed Jesus. They'd already given this group one warning. Now they were not beyond moving to death. They plotted, figuring it out, how can we do this? Uh, part of their plotting was not necessarily just uh, what to do, but how to do it. Because technically they didn't have a capital authority in the Jewish body here. They had violated that. Uh, you know, they did have to go to the, uh, they certainly didn't give uh, Jesus a fair hearing. They, they trumped up the charges against him at his, at his arrest, but they did have to take him to the Roman authorities. And, um, but here they are plotting, and are they going to somehow, were they plotting to how to take it to the Romans? We don't know. Later in, in chapter 7, we're going to see the martyrdom of Stephen, and that goes completely off, off the wagon. I mean, they, they go off the charts there because they take that into their own hands. But something happens in verse 34. One in the council stood up, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, held in respect by all the people, and commanded them to put the apostles outside for a little while. Very interesting development. So he said, basically, gentlemen, let's go into executive session. Let's clear the room and just the council here, let's talk. And so the apostles are, are, are put out, um, and maybe a few others. They close the doors, and he begins to, to talk. Now, let's pause for a moment, and let's look at, at this man, Gamaliel, and let's remind ourselves of something about what, what we're told about him here. We're told he's a Pharisee. We've talked a little bit about the Pharisees being one of the political, religious groupings of the Jewish leadership in this period of the first century, the other major one being the Sadducees. Primarily, the Pharisees and the Sadducees are the two here. The Pharisees are the minority party, if you will, in the Sanhedrin or the ruling bloc. The Sadducees held more of the power and we're, we're there. We've, we've talked about uh, the, the Pharisees, and um, it's an interesting uh, name. They, it, it basically comes from a word means to separate. Uh, they, they had separated out, um, and that's kind of what it means. And they, the separation wasn't a total physical separation where they moved off into a commune or anything like that. But they separated themselves in terms of um, piety, holiness, their approach to the study of the law, and as well as even their, their individual uh, teaching. They were not a politically minded group. They were very zealous for the law. They, uh, as a body, they spent their time in scholarly pursuits of the study of the law and held uh, distinctive um, views from the, the other Sanhedrin. The, um, the Pharisees, for instance, believed in a, in a resurrection. Uh, the Sadducees did not. We'll see this come into play later when Paul is arrested in, in the temple, and he plays that off in the crowd basically to protect himself. But the Pharisees believed in a, a resurrection. Now, um, they, they also believed in kind of the idea of an, an immortal soul. And so, when, you, when we say that they believed in a resurrection, I'm not saying that they believed in it completely as we read about it, let's say, in 1 Corinthians 15 or 1 Thessalonians 4, uh, particularly 1 Corinthians 15 where it talks about being changed from mortal to immortality in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the sounding of the trumpet. Uh, that's not necessarily how the Pharisees looked at it. They, all, they believed in, in um, uh, they didn't, obviously, they didn't accept Christ. They weren't looking for Him to return. They did look for a Messiah. They did believe the Scriptures that David was going to rule over, again, a reunited Israel from the prophecies of Ezekiel. Uh, and they, they had some understanding of that vision of the Valley of Dry Bones in some way, but they, they looked more towards some type of a bodily resurrection that would not necessarily be exactly as we would understand a glorified body as we become a part of the family of God, I certainly would not have understood the, 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 the truth of a resurrection to glory, to immortality, 
bringing us into the divine status fully as the part of the family of God, which is what the Bible teaches and what, what we believe. So they didn't have that full understanding when it comes to the resurrection. And so, but, you know, they were, they were certainly closer to the Sadducees who, who rejected the idea of a, of a resurrection. Uh, the Pharisees did look for a, a messianic age and even a personal Messiah. They believed in angels and demons. Uh, they also believed in the free will of man. And, and they sought to live a life, in a sense, uh, apart from um, a lot of the trappings of the normal, um, uh, let's say, upper class pursuits, which the Sadducees were fully bought, uh, fully uh, appreciative of and, and seeking in terms of their political associations there. And so the Pharisees still had their problems. Jesus clashed with them. But we now we have here this man, Gamaliel, who is of that group. They're a minority group within the Sanhedrin. The, the arrangement there was essentially the, the uh, the, the Sadducees had to accommodate the Pharisees into, a, uh, if you will, a political arrangement because the Pharisees had a larger following of, among the common people, while the Sadducees looked at themselves as more elite. And so they, they had to listen to them. They had to include them in the, in the ruling body here. And they have at this point in time a leading individual named Gamaliel, who is called a teacher of the law, held in respect by all the people, and that speaks a great deal. We do know about this man from other writings of the time. He was a, a grandson of a uh, man named Hillel, a, a previous teacher who had uh, had high standing within the Jews because of his devotion, his, uh, his piety and, and appreciation and teaching of the law. Gamaliel descended from him. And he had it, he, he is, we, we know from Paul that Paul was a disciple of this particular Gamaliel. Uh, Paul tells us that later in his writings. Paul had studied in his school. He, so Gamaliel is, is uh, in a sense, a, he's a revered, exalted teacher, uh, rabbi, if you wanted, would want to call it, in the sense of a, a, a respected teacher. But he had a school. And students sat at his feet, which is kind of what we do when we go to classes. You're sitting uh, at our feet. Um, in the sense that you sit in, in a class and you learn from the instructors here at ABC, that's what, uh, that's what people did. And Paul was his most famous disciple. Now, Gamaliel has a high standing um, uh, among the people at this time, as, as it says, as a teacher of the law. Uh, from the other writings, he is, he's referred to, even he had, he had a nickname called the beauty of the law. The beauty of the law. In other words, his teaching, his style... His character, his personality uh, drew people to, in a sense, he, he had a way of teaching and explaining things that was uh, attractive. And so he's called, he was called the beauty of the, of the law. And he was, he was given the title of Rabban, which is an exalted teacher, uh, not given to everybody and very highly esteemed. esteemed. And again, we, we find later in Acts 22, verse 3, that Paul was taught by him. And, and so, uh, what, and that's interesting from just the perspective of getting, not only getting a bit more information about Paul and his background, but also because of what Gamaliel is about to say. Gamaliel is about to, to counsel tolerance, uh, caution, uh, wisdom is what he's going to lay down here. And his one of his, his prominent disciples, Saul, who we'll, we'll be introduced to later, is not, at this point in time, doesn't have that tolerance. He doesn't have that, uh, that wisdom, if you will, because our first introduction to Saul, which is going to come at the end of chapter 7, is as a persecutor. He doesn't like these people. And he's out to destroy if you will, the church of God. But Gamaliel has a different point of view. So look at verse 35 as to what he says. He says, men of Israel, and again, note what Gamaliel says. He's addressing this body of leaders, and he, he too uses the collective term, the inclusive term of Israel, meaning all of Israel. Um, he, um, you know, we, we sometimes overlook these things and, and what that tells us about what God is telling us, I think. 
as God in, in, uh, drops in. Israel's not forgotten. Israel's uh, still a part of God's plan, uh, that, a plan that began with the promises that were first given to Abraham back in Genesis 12, and then we passed along to Isaac and then to Jacob and Ephraim and Manasseh. Um, the, you know, the, the fullness of these promises are still on the table. And I think sometimes we just need to rec recognize what is being said in, in, in such a common phrase here. Anyway, he said, take heed to yourselves that you intend what you intend to do regarding these men. Let's pause here. Let's think this through. For some time ago, he said, let's have a little bit of a history lesson. Thutis rose up claiming to be somebody. All right? He makes a historical reference to someone named Thutis, who we don't have any other reference in the Bible about this man. Um, and a number of men, about 400, joined him. He was slain, and all who obeyed him were scattered and came to nothing. Now, we have some references to such an insurrectionist named Thutis um, in a, at least in more than one occasion. There is, there is a reference to a Thutis. Now, keep in mind, this, this episode is happening in the early 30s, let's say 32, 32 A.D., 32 A.D. We have a reference to a Thutis back in the year 4... Uh, is it, get, my, get my quote here right, I believe it's 4 B.C., at the death of, of Herod the Great. Um, let's see... Yes, 4 B.C., 4 B.C., there was, a, uh, there was an insurrection um, at that particular time, uh, and this was at the time of the death of Herod the Great. Herod the Great, remember, is the, is the uh, great king, rebuilt Jerusalem. He's the one who engineered the death of the firstborn at the time of Jesus' birth in an attempt to destroy this future prophesied king, which he, which he feared. Now, we have from the, the Jewish writer Josephus a focus upon another man named Thutis about 10, 12 years later from the time here of Acts in the year 44 A.D., 44 A.D. And because we, we have this, scholars look at this and they think Luke gets it wrong because Josephus talks about a... a specific Thutis in 44 AD, AD, they know that there was a major insurrection um, uh, and there were individuals named Thutis at, at that time back in 4 BC, and they think Luke is mixed up or he didn't read as Josephus writer or whatever, and they use this as kind of sense Luke the historian making a mistake. Then there's another school of thought among the historians that we just don't have all the information of all that was taking place. Uh, prior to this in Galilee or Judea regarding Jewish insurrections. And there are a number of commentators who lean toward that as well, and so they don't dismiss Luke as making a historical mistake here. Uh, I would uh, side with those commentators uh, and, and just you know, back away and realize we probably don't have all the information. Give Luke the benefit of the doubt for at least two major reasons. First of all, the inspiration of God's Spirit involved here. Secondly, so much, you know, so much of the other references, historical, geographical, um, otherwise in the book of Acts, is accurate, as, as we see as we go along here. It's descriptions of the temple. Uh, we'll see geographic references that are uh, uh, precise and spot on. And so for Luke to make a mistake here by recording something that happened would have happened 10 or 12 years after the event um, and does not read as Josephus correct, I don't think is, is right. Uh, he mentions another person here. Uh, the, there's a reference to another man. Uh, Gamaliel does in verse 37, after this man, Judas of Galilee, rose up in the days of the census and drew away many people after him. He also perished, and all who obeyed him were uh, d dispersed. So here's a reference to a, someone, again, we know from hi history of, uh, of an, up, an insurrection that took place in the Galilee, the, the northern region of, of Judea, uh, there are, uh, uh, north of, J of Jerusalem, several miles. I don't have that map up to, to point to it, but I think ho hopefully all of you 
know your, um, have it in your mind's eye, the is Israel geography. But Gamaliel's point is, look, there have been rabble-rousers. There have been insurrections. We historically know them, and we can tick them off that they all came to nothing. They didn't throw off the yoke of Rome. They didn't set up any messianic kingdom. Their message, their actions led to nothing except uh, destruction and death. And so this is his setup. Look at verse 38. Now I say to you, keep away from these men. Keep away from these men. Let them alone. For if this plan or this work is of men, it will come to nothing. That is wise advice. He has the ability to distance himself from the politics of the entire group from the moment and to, to have a historical perspective. History is a great thing. Uh, that's why one, one reason I love history and a reason why you should, should love history as well, it gives you a perspective that the here and now is not the only time something's happened, that there's a reason for the way things are to this point. Um, within the church, within the, you know, a nation's history and, or the development of an organization. There's a reason why. There are other things that have been tried and found not suitable, etc. And Gamaliel is doing this, and he's saying, look, we've, we've seen all these things happen before. And he says, he's also implying they're not leading an army, they're not taking up arms, and they're not calling for the overthrow of Rome. This, that's implied here. It's not um, implicit, but this is what's implied. What, what's happening? People are being healed. People are happy. Uh, there is a movement, yes. And is it eating into the following of the, the Jews? Well, yes. Do they perceive it as a threat? Yes, but that's their problem. And again, Gamaliel just has the, the, the patience to let, it, to let it go. He says in verse 39, But if it is of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest you even be found to fight against God. Brilliant. Brilliant. Let it alone. Of its own weight, it'll collapse. If it's of God, though, you're, you don't want to be fighting against God. It's, it's almost like, what if they're right? What if their interpretation of Scripture is right? And we may have been wrong. What if this body killed an innocent man, killed God in the flesh? What if is what he's laying out there? And so they agreed, verse 40. They agreed with him. It brought a, brought a calm. Sometimes it's that one voice in a group where people are getting stirred up to go jump off the cliff or to do something unwise. Sometimes it's just one person. You know, for each of us, look at the advice of Gamaliel. And though he is, let's say, he's not a, quote, church member. He had read the law. He was schooled in the law, which is the, the holy word of God as he had it at that time, and that would have been all the books of the Bible that we're, we're studying, and he had wisdom. You know, someone who may not have God's Spirit, and it may not be a first fruit, may not be, as we would say, in the church, we, you know, have all these terms, uh, converted, can still read the Bible, study history, and be moved and influenced in a positive way just by studying the Bible and letting that, in a sense, rub off on him, which I think, which I think Gamaliel did, to where at least he was, he was not rushing to judgment. He was not getting caught up in, in anger of the crowd. He was not moved by jealousy or envy. But he had been schooled in the, the Word of God, and he, he was, that was a part of his life. And to that degree, he benefited from it. It benefits the church, and it calmed down the crowd of, of, of the Sanhedrin. And so they called for the apostles. My, my point is, before I leave it, read this and benefit from it. Be a Gamaliel at times. Let yourself be one who can 
not get caught up in the emotion of, of, a, of a situation or your friends or a family or you know, a grouping of, that might be bent on doing something that's not quite right, wise or right and step aside and see it all. And with the working of the Bible and your knowledge of God in you, help you to understand something, but then you've got to have the courage to say it. Gamaliel could have gone along with the crowd and said, well, you know, these guys, you know, who are they? They're just fishermen from Galilee, and I'm not going to jeopardize my standing here with the group. But he, he, he too has courage. Peter had his courage in standing up and saying, We're, we ought to obey God rather than men. It took Gamaliel an amount of courage to stand up in his peer group here and know that he was going against the wishes and maybe the, 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 movement, the mood of the moment and by cautioning patience and you know, leniency on, the, on this group. And so don't discount that. Be a Gamaliel in, in that sense and learn from this. So what did they do? Well, they called the apostles and they beat them and they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus, and then they let them go. All right, you guys, come back in. Uh, bring, bring, out the, bring out the rods. Bring out the whips. And they beat them. Uh, probably right there in, in front of uh, everyone and punished them. And they, they had to do something, and that vented their fury for the moment. And so in verse 41, they departed from the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for His name. And so again, like they did before, though it's not said, they probably went back and they reported what was done, but they were, they were, there was a joy here. You know, and this is the fruit of the joy. The joy is listed as the second fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5. Um, they rejoiced, but they rejoiced that they had been called before the council, and even rejoiced that they had a few lashes put on them. That takes courage um, and, and commitment as well. And um, that, so they reported it. It goes on, verse 42, And daily in the temple and in every house they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. So they continued to do what they were, uh, were to do, and in every house... And again, we uh, can probably see implied here that they um, were, the church was benefiting from this. So that brings us to the end of chapter 5. As we look at the beginning of chapter 6, Luke kind of has a transition by the word now. Uh, so in those days, so some days, maybe a few weeks, uh, maybe even a few months, uh, pass, pass on the scene here. Um, the church, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, multiplying, so the church continues to grow. Even though the, the, the um, Jews are reaching out and um, seeking to, to uh, disrupt the, the work of the church, um, that, that is taking place here. And um, there, there's growth. And with growth, sometimes comes hiccups and problems. We've We've talked about certain problems, Ananias and Sapphira, persecution. Now there's a, here's another challenge or issue. It's not quite like the other two. It's an internal organizational matter, but it, it reflects a bit of tension among some of the groupings of people within the church and the need to address it and to come up with a solution. Because it says there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution, all right? A lot to, or is said here in uh, verse 1. So let's kind of break it down and look at what we're seeing here. Uh, first of all, there's a complaint. Okay, I have something against you. Um, the complaint box was filling up in the church hall. Uh, uh, in this case, there, was, there were widows neglected in a daily distribution. I understand something, first of all, about the daily distribution. They, the, the Jews had a system of welfare, taking care of people, food and clothing and stuff among those who, who were indigent, in, in need, or the poor. And the church was a part of that too in the community, 
But they also, it seems, were by this time, were because of the growth of the church, they were developing their own systems to provide for a, a daily distribution of, uh, of needs, of, of food and of uh, clothing, and maybe even, even shelter uh, there. And so uh, th this was a part of the, the life of the church, and, and it, it marks the, the hospitality and the love and the sharing that we've already read about, where they shared and had all things in common. Remember? Uh, as as uh, Luke has, has brought that out. And so they're taking care of each other, and particularly the widows. Now, there's a lot of instruction from the Old Testament to take care of the widow, the orphanless, the fatherless, even the stranger in your midst. A lot of the law talks about that. But widows seem to have a very particular uh, spot uh, for, within God's heart that you, you take care of them and you provide for them. And they were doing that. But some were being neglected. It is the widows of the Hellenist. Now, what's a Hellenist? All right, let's, let's, talk, let's look at that for a moment. A Hellenist, the word comes from the, the word Hellenism or Hellene, which basically refers to the Greek world, the Greek world, all right? Now, these were, what these were, were Greek-speaking Jews who had been living in the Greek world. Remember, with the fall of Jerusalem at the time of Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel, there's a captivity, and with that captivity came a dispersal ultimately in the subsequent generations, even after the Jews or a portion of them returned to Jerusalem. I've already said uh, in, in that return, remember, not all the Jews left Babylon and went back to Jerusalem. Many stayed there, but also many began to migrate. And by ultimately, you know, the, the Greek world under Alexander uh, succeeded the Persian world, and the, the Greek culture spread out of, of Greece throughout uh, all of this part of the world and, and further to the, to the east. And commerce and trade developed. The, the Greeks, even before the time of Alexander, the Greeks were a seafaring people, and they, they, had, they were over here in, in the western Mediterranean, they had the, the cities on the uh, Mediterranean edge of Asia Minor were initially Greek cities. Um, Miletus down here, which is mentioned, we'll see that in the book of Acts, uh, and uh, Ephesus, and these, these were Greek city-states, which is why uh, the, the Persians were interested in them and the Greeks were interested in all of this because the Greeks had gone around. The Jews became a part of that mix, and through economic needs and they had migrated through this. And so at a certain point, uh, they were still Jews, even though they were Greek-speaking, and they didn't speak Hebrew quite, as, not as their first language. But in the subsequent generations, by the time we come down here to the first century, many Greek-speaking Jews, Hellenists, they had, been, they had been Hellenized, they came back to Jerusalem, and they settled there. And maybe their husband died. And maybe their children remained over here in Asia Minor, and so you have a woman in Jerusalem who's a widow, but she comes up, becomes a part of the church. But she's a Hellenist, and that is there's a distinction within the community between a Jew or a, a, a Hebrew who had stayed in the land and had, a, had roots in the land as opposed to someone who immigrated in from, let's say, Tarsus up here in Cilicia, and they spoke Greek. Now, just again, keep in mind and understand this. When we come to later this week in class, we're going to go through Daniel 11 in more detail, and I'll talk a little bit more about the, the, um, the influence on the Greek world, the Greek empire of that period on the Jews in Jerusalem, which is a part of the story of the abomination of desolation, Antiochus Epiphanes, and that, that part of the latter verses of the book of Daniel, uh, chapter 11. Um, what had happened was the, the Greek world of Alexander and his successor generals, and, the, and especially with the episode of Antiochus Epiphanes and the abomination of desolation, his effort to stamp out the Jews, forbidding them to keep the Sabbath, uh, circumcise their children, uh, sacrificing a pig on the altar in the temple, uh, which led to the Maccabean re Rebellion. That created uh, 
historically an aversion to Greek within the Jews in Jerusalem, which led to them throwing that off, but the Greek stayed. And if you, if you use the term and think of the Greek world, the Greek influence as the world, as opposed to the righteousness, let's say, of, the, of Judaism, you got a conflict. And that's what's, what's working historically in, in part of the story of Daniel 11, but now pops up here in, in Acts 6 with this group of widows who are Hellenistic in the sense that they speak Greek, they grew up and spent the majority of their life as a Jew in, in the Greek world, they come back to Jerusalem, but the Jewish culture here looks at them as, with a little bit, eh, you're too close to the Greek. You've spent time there. And if you think about this, it, 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 create, it created attention because some of their widows were being neglected. In other words, some of this even still rubbed off into the church, even though the church is sharing things uh, among themselves at this, at this point in time. And so the, the Hellenistic uh, group say, hey, we didn't get enough for our, our group this week. Or they got shortchanged. Or, you know, something was said. And there's a little bit of prejudice here working. And that worldly mix within the Jewish community of Jerusalem is still a part of what's happening in, in the church now. And so that it's not a division uh, you know, in terms of a full-blown separation, but it, it, it's creating a situation where the widows are being neglected. And so you've got a problem, and it's an organizational problem. And so what happens here between verses 2 and 7 is the solution to that problem. And so we'll wait till the next class to get into the solution to that problem because it, it really sets up a lot of instruction for us in the church today to help us understand how and why we do what we do in terms of taking care of one another in the church and uh, some of the church structure. So we'll talk about that in, in the next class because the, um, these first seven verses of Acts 6 really give us a basis of understanding how to address organizationally some of the challenges that come up uh, so that they don't become bigger problems. And that, uh, that will help us understand some of the matters that we do in the church today. So we'll cover that next class.